Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Holocaust Center's Director of Education. Thank you to our community partners on this program, the Queen Anne Book Company, the Honorary Consulate of Hungary in Seattle, and Seattle Public Schools Library Services. If you are interested in purchasing the book, The Yellow Star House, which Paul Regelbrug will be discussing today, please shop local and order the book from our partner, the Queen Anne Book Company. Thank you also to Michelle Quinones, who is providing closed captioning for us today. I want to start today with a quote from a student. We are to act, to do something, anything, to raise one's head up and yell, stop this madness for the sake of humanity, for the sake of how we wish to be remembered long after we're gone. This was an excerpt of an essay from a sixth grader, Madison Grunig at Finch Elementary School in Spokane in 2012. She was the first place winner of the Holocaust Center's writing contest that year. Over the next several years, our writing art and film contest, which receives hundreds of entries from across the state, consistently had winners from this one rural elementary school in Eastern Washington. This is the power of an exceptional teacher, a teacher who not only believes wholeheartedly in the importance of the subject matter, but who knows how to access resources and create opportunities for his students. Sixth graders at this school at Finch Elementary School in Spokane were voluntarily joining an after-school book club focused on the Holocaust led by teacher Paul Regelbrug. Paul knew that learning about the Holocaust had the power to challenge students to see the world differently, to look both within themselves and outside of themselves. Working with the Holocaust Center, Paul brought a survivor to Spokane to meet his students. He attended teacher workshops and used the Holocaust Center's online resources. I first had the opportunity to meet Paul at a teacher training the Holocaust Center organized in Ellensburg in 2014. He stood out for his earnestness and his curiosity. After working as a lawyer for more than 15 years, Paul turned his focus to education, looking for more ways to make a positive impact on the world. Whether he was teaching in Chicago, Spokane, New York, or Renton, he saw firsthand the effect of Holocaust education on his students. So in 2017, when Paul told me he was writing a book for his students based on the story of local Holocaust survivor, Robert Holzer, the same survivor who had come to meet his sixth graders in Spokane years earlier, I knew he was going to apply the same passion, creativity, and determination to this book as he had applied to his teaching. Paul is exceptional in so many ways, but Paul also shows us that when we invest in our teachers, when we provide opportunities for them to learn and grow, when we provide them with resources, and when we value them, they will pass this along to their students, our children, and grandchildren. At the Holocaust Center, it is our mission to invest in our teachers. This year, we are launching a new educational initiative, Confront the Past, Create the Future, in which we offer teachers a menu of programs and resources, including a virtual speakers bureau, online teacher training, a virtual field trip experience, and a new online platform of best practices, which includes videos, lesson plans, and activities. We are now also fortunate to have Paul on staff as our professional development and curriculum coordinator to mentor and train teachers and to create educational materials for the Holocaust Center to share, including the best practices, which are available now on our website. It is my pleasure to have with us today as our speaker, Paul Regelbrug, author of the newly published The Yellow Star House. Paul will answer questions at the end of today's presentation Please type in your questions at any time into the Q&A. Paul, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you so much, Alana. I'm truly flattered. I guess I should uh, quit on that intro. <laughs> I don't know how I can top that. So thank you, truly. And boy, it's truly my, my privilege and pleasure to share with you today an overview of the story of the book, uh, The Yellow Star House. Uh, which I wrote to specifically honor the memory uh, of uh, my friend, Robert Holzer, who passed away uh, boy, a couple weeks from, from now uh, in 2017. 
and uh, his rescuer, Ara Juretsian. So I'm gonna click uh, to share a screen here so you can see a little bit of what I'd like to share. Um, like any book, I suppose, uh, it's quite a journey. Uh, literally, this journey took me from uh, to, to Budapest in Hungary, to Washington, D.C., to uh, find uh, uh, this book that Juretsian had written. Um, and of course, it was in, I've met along the way so many incredible people, uh, you know, people that are relatives of, of uh, those mentioned in the book, and I learned so much throughout it. And it was also an incredible um, uh, emotional uh, journey, really, because in the process of writing, especially when you're writing about people who were murdered um, during the Holocaust, and all of a sudden you're, you're in situations and scenes and you're writing, and there's this dialogue, it's a real chilling effect, really. Uh, it's, it, I almost am too humbled to try to put words in the mouths of some of these people who perished. And as I sat there some nights writing, uh, with, uh, with pictures of some of these people beside me, uh, it, was, it was a lot. And um, so I'm pleased to be able to share with you some highlights of the story. And I'm also pleased to, at the end of this presentation, to introduce you to several of the, or to some of the uh, relatives of people mentioned in the book. Um, so let's see, okay. I met Robert first back in about uh, 2010, I believe it was approximately, when I was teaching, as Alana had mentioned, at uh, uh, Finch Elementary School in Spokane. And at that time, I, was, I had been teaching in Chicago previously, and I knew the importance of uh, speaker testimony, survivor testimony, and I wanted to bring that in to really elucidate some of the lessons that we had learned. And um, so, uh, you know, I find the Holocaust Center for Humanity out in the Seattle area, and they hooked me up with this, with Robert Holzer. And Robert flies over at that time. He was living in uh, Vancouver, Washington, and uh, he flew out, and I picked him up at the airport, and here's this short man who had recently had a heart procedure, and he's sort of limping along, and uh, just, just a fireball right away, just so opinionated and laughing and, you know, quick to tell stories and ask questions and just learn. And... Um, this, my students, of course, we had previewed parts of the story a little bit, you know, so that I could get them ready for this, uh, this man with this thick Hungarian accent. And uh, my students were really particularly blown away by the fact that, you know, most people learning about the Holocaust, they learned the Nazis were the bad guys, and it's sort of a black and white issue. But Robert's story was sort of unique in that what happened in Budapest and what happened in Hungary in general um, involved to such a great extent, um, their fellow Hungarians. And this was kind of overwhelming for many of the students imagining, you know, fellow countrymen turning on others uh, based on uh, religion and on race. And so in the picture to the right, um, Robert had come and spoken to our class and you see in the right there, if you see my cursor, uh, Robert is, I guess, in the middle row there. And with his arm around him is uh, one of my uh, former students. Her name is Hannah Tomeo. And she was so moved by the story. Not only did she demand to me in advance to be his personal escort uh, while he was going through the halls at our school, but at the end, uh, she's of Native American descent. And she uh, presented with her family a blanket to Robert that he so cherished. He was so moved. And to Robert's dying day, he would still ask about Hannah and still talk about what that giving that blanket from another persecuted people in history and how much that meant to him. So after Robert had come, we had kept in touch and we had uh, developed quite a relationship and friendship of exchanges. Um, Robert would frequently uh, expound upon his political views of the moment, which uh, <laughs> were always something else to listen to. And uh, in addition, Robert, um, he, he told me, oh boy, this was something. When he had an opportunity, he always insisted when he first came to meet, me, to meet us that if he ever found out that his rescuer, Ara Jaretsian, uh, was still alive, because he had no idea at that point if he was alive. He assumed he was dead. But if he was ever alive, that he would get on a plane and go meet him. And uh, one day, Robert contacted me to say, you'll never believe it. I found out that he's alive. I flew to Budapest and I met him, and I'll tell you a couple things about that towards the end of this presentation. 
So time went on, we continued our friendship and contacts and things, even though I moved around a bit. And um, uh, it, they got to 2017 when I became a United States Holocaust Museum teacher fellow, and we had to do this project. And so with the help and the support and encouragement of my then director, Kristen Thompson, she uh, you know, basically encouraged and helped me get this project running. I contacted Robert, knew that his health was in you know, pretty bad, very bad uh, condition at that point, and said, Robert, what do you think about you know, me trying to take a stab at telling the story of you and your rescuer, Ara? And he was so happy and so encouraging, but you better, because at the time I was calling him from DC, and he's like, you better get over here fast though, I can't guarantee how much longer I have. So armed with many previous interviews and transcripts that he had done with many people, I went in and I tried to like pinpoint certain things and uh, Robert and his wife Jan uh, sort of accused me of, as, of interviewing him more as a lawyer than as a, as a paper or journalist, I suppose. But in any event, uh, it was a real extraordinary time and I learned so much more. And uh, it was he who gave me the full encouragement when I talked to him about the style I wanted to write it in. He's, and I wanted to include dialogue so that this story would be accessible to younger students as well. Um, he says, Paul, I am putty in your hands. He says, I trust you. And he says, I think you know me and the people I've been talking about enough to do it. And so I did, and that was my mission. So uh, the project started, and uh, let me tell you a little bit now about this book. Okay, so you can see other, don't be too shocked because of course it's such a, an incredibly beautiful boy. Um, that's Robert in the upper left corner and also in the bottom right corner with his mother. And in the top right there is a picture of his father. Uh, Robert's father was Lajos Holzer. It was, uh, uh, he's from a very large family, one of uh, 12 or 13 kids. Uh, they were a Jewish family, but not very observant at all. Uh, Robert's father was not particularly uh, educated, but he was an incredible kind of sage, really. Apparently, everyone would approach him. He had friends. He would go to the local coffee house, and people would gather around him and sort of treat him like he was a, a jurist and uh, ask him to adjudicate their disputes and just share coffees together. Um, and with the father's side of the family, Robert really uh, enjoyed his time so much because they were kids, you know, some of his brothers and sisters were, were of, of, uh, of Laos were younger. And so Robert got to play and have a sense of adventure and freedom when he was with them and had great meals. Um, however, his mother's side uh, was much more uh, orthodox, really. And uh, Robert really didn't like that side of things. He, he resented it, really. He also resented that his mother forced him to play the piano. Uh, so that's detailed definitely in the book. Uh, and there was one uh, scene later on where he's over at his mother's family and they were in uh, a town a little bit north of Budapest called Vas, V-A-C. And um, Robert, uh, sort of in an act of defiance, took a uh, non-kosher uh, ham hock from a local butcher and went to the steps of the synagogue and ate it on top of the synagogue steps uh, intentionally to be seen by his mother's family's friends and things. Uh, so when that happened, oh boy, did it cause a, a, a kind of a civil war in the family in terms of what Robert had done. So just a little bit to sort of prepare you, in this backdrop here, Robert had experienced um, uh, he had learned at a very young age, sadly, that he was someone other, that he was an other. Um, it was a, an early experience account, recounted in the book in the very first chapter when he's playing a game of marbles and suddenly this older boy gets upset and he, he basically shouts something about, I'd rather uh, give, I'd rather throw these marbles down uh, into the gutter than to give them to a dirty Jew. And Robert's like, what? You know, because he had never identified himself as anyone, let alone as an other. He was just a boy. And so in the first part of the book, there are sort of a series of episodes of things that had occurred that each one increasing sort of in intensity as time went on. Um, before, before, so hunger, you just need to know a little bit before basically sort of the walls close in and, uh, you know, the Germans come in. Uh, into Hungary. So 
as a result of right after World War I, the Trianon Pact in 1920 uh, basically led to Hungary losing 66% uh, of its pre-World War I territory. And uh, so at that point, Hungary is, uh, is shrunken and uh, there's a lot of political turmoil. The Habsburg Empire comes to a close and uh, in their place, there was a brief flirtation in 1919 with communism uh, of which many of the people that were in charge there were apparently Jewish. And so that sort of brought Jews into the limelight in Hungary in terms of people starting to turn against them, building upon sort of a longstanding um, history of anti-Semitism in Hungary. But for the most part in Budapest, not that bad because they were so interwoven in business there. So um, in any event, uh, s s once the alliance is formed, Hungary rejoins the Axis. Um, at this point, uh, with the Germans, they start to gain territory back. So you can see in this picture here, the orange shows uh, Hungary that basically leading up to uh, World War II. And then once the alliance uh, with Germany starts in 1940, you can see that little by little, uh, Hungary is annexing and gaining more territory as Germany is as well. So all of a sudden, this orange part expands into parts from uh, Yugoslavia and Romania and uh, Czechoslovakia as well. And over here on the right, uh, I said that the Habsburg Empire came to an end and uh, ultimately in their place, they appointed a regent and his name was Admiral Miklos Horthy. And Robert always used to say to me, he says, how absurd is this uh, in a landlocked country that we have an admiral? Because admiral, of course, being you know, naval or uh, yeah, water. So, but anyways, Horthy operated and, um, you know, controversial figure. He did some things absolutely that were anti-Semitic and were divisive but also did some things sort of trying to halt and to sort of stop um, uh, the, the Nazi sort of uh, engine from uh, in, its, in its course. And you'll see more about that a little bit later. Uh, but one thing that happened during this period while Horthy was in charge was um, it was for 24 years really that he was running the place. And uh, it really almost became a feudal type of system, a little authoritative, but it permitted political, uh, political opposition. And it was in this mode of all this political opposition that splinter parties formed. So as you saw on that last slide, uh, there were in 1941, two slides ago, in 1941, there were 825,000 Jews in Hungary, which made up about 6% of the total population. Um, so up to the German occupation uh, in March 19th, 1944, um, at this point, Robert and his mother were alone because his father, Lajos, had been sort of, he had already been sent into forced labor and was ultimately deported to a concentration camp in what is now Serbia, and it was called Bor, B-O-R. And so he and his mother are alone, and um, Robert is sort of like running errands, and he's a courier and things like that, trying to gain some money as, uh, as, as things are getting slightly worse, but they became uh, much worse. Uh, in March 1944. And so I'm going to let Robert explain to you about what occurred at that point. All came to an end in 1944, March 19th, when the Germans finally sensed that uh, Hungary might want to leave uh, the Nazi uh, uh, alliance, the Axis, and join perhaps with the Allies. Uh, there were rumors flying in the air because Romania was already out of the war and they thought perhaps Hungary would do the same. The Soviet army was coming very close to Hungary up from the north and east and uh, the Romanian forces also joined the Soviet forces and were attacking uh, from the east. Under the circumstances, the Germans uh, occupied Hungary, Eichmann arrived, and now the deportation started. They emptied the countryside first. I woke up one day in, I think it was July, 1944 July, and realized that my mother's family, who came from the country, they uh, were 
gone. They were all taken to Auschwitz. My grandparents, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles, everybody was gone. And none of them came back after the war. None, not one person of my mother's family who lived in the countryside survived. At least not to my knowledge. In the meantime, we knew that eventually, once they emptied the countryside, which was extremely swift, because in no country did the Germans get as much cooperation as in Hungary. They practically had absolutely no manpower invested in the whole uh, campaign, because uh, the Hungarian uh, town and village mayors uh, the gendarmerie, they were all eager to help and uh, show their efficiency and loyalty to the cause. Uh, but finally they came to Budapest. So you can see in the upper right corner, there is a, a picture uh, and that is uh, indeed Robert's mother's family. The person where you see the cursor there on the far right is Robert's mother and uh, all four of the people uh, to her right um, were murdered by the Nazis. Um, and that, as you can imagine, was absolutely devastating to Robert's mother in particular, and of course also to Robert. Uh, in this map over to the far left here, uh, the, I'm pointing the cursor where Budapest is. If you go just a little bit north to the tip of the, the top of the Danube there where it starts to break over to the left, it's in this area here where they lived in Vats. And again, um, the Nazis' approach was basically between May 15th and July 9th of 1944, with the great help, as Robert said, of the gendarmerie and, and the support of locals in Hungary throughout the provinces. Uh, 440,000 Hungarian Jews were deported and most were murdered in Auschwitz. And all that was left essentially was here in Budapest. In Budapest, um, there were between 160,000 and 200,000 Jews who were living there at this time. And uh, they were, in terms of what the Nazis' approach was and their intent, they were next. Um, however, you know, again, as I said before, Robert growing up listened to his father and they had sort of a disbelief that anything terrible would happen to Jews first of all in Hungary, but in particular in Budapest, while everything, they were aware of things happening in Poland and in surrounding areas, but they were in disbelief that things could ever get bad because they felt they were so intertwined within the fabric of life in Budapest. They were in government, they were in business, they were part of it. It wasn't like a shtetl life or anything. They were part of the lifeblood of Hungary, the arts, music, business, etc. And so this was quite a shock then when all of a sudden, uh, in June 1944, uh, the Jews were uh, ordered into Yellow Star houses. Uh, now, at this point, again, as I had said, Robert's father was already in the, in the Boer concentration camp. They were getting periodic updates sometimes, but, uh, you know, again, news was increasingly worse uh, for Jews throughout uh, this part of Europe at this time. And um, so, uh, at they're ordered into a yellow star house. Now this person, this woman in the upper right corner is Robert's aunt. So this would be uh, Aranka, and that is uh, Robert's father's uh, sister. And she was just an incredible person, so resourceful, always one step ahead in her thinking. And she already sort of sensing that things were getting worse. She had already lost her husband uh, fighting over in, uh, in, in the Soviet Union, um, clearing mines. And um, she took advantage of some various, some, manipulated some papers, took advantage of the fact that her husband looked Aryan and got some forged documents and moved into this apartment house at a building called One Zishi Geno. And so she moves in there and gets there. And so that was, a, even though she is now like under quote unquote Gentile status, there were many Jews that lived there and it becomes marked as one of these yellow star houses, which is where, for the, from the Nazi perspective, this is where the, the sort of like a precursor to ghettos, et cetera. 
And Aranka moves in, and once uh, everyone is ordered into Yellow Star houses, she invites Robert and his mother and various other members of uh, Aranka's family to come into this uh, smallish apartment. There are 10 or 11 of them living in there, but they figure that this will be a safe place, at least for now, and she's hoping to avail herself of her status. Um, indeed, uh, one quick episode, you know, during this time, as things are getting increasingly worse, and of course they're having to wear yellow stars, um, Robert, uh, is, uh, as well as other teenagers, had to go to this weekly labor battalion duty every weekend, and one day, for some unbelievable reason <laughs> uh, that's really unknown, uh, Aranka says, Robert, where is it that you are supposed to report tomorrow? And Robert says, over just in the you know north, in the suburb immediately outside of uh, Budapest. And for whatever reason, Robert had no idea why Aranka had a really bad uh, premonition or feeling about uh, what was uh, ahead. And she says, you're not going tomorrow. You're, you're going to be sick. I will go in and I will tell the person at the station that you're too sick to report today. And uh, all of Robert's buddies and his friends, they go over there as reported and as normal where Robert would have gone. And um, unbelievably, Robert discovers later that his friends and his uh, uh, partners uh, were uh, put all onto, from their work onto a train and deported to Auschwitz and, and all of them were murdered on that day. And uh, Aranka had no idea, but just had this feeling. So, so they're in this Zishigeno, and again, things are getting increasingly worse, but for Hungary's sake, for Horthy's sake, this is, they've, they sort of see the writing on the wall that, you know what, it's really evident we're on the losing side. Romania has now already left the axis, and now Hungary is intending to do the same. And so Regent Horthy, in a sort of badly planned exit from the, uh, the axis, he, uh, he says, uh, this is the day, fellow Hungarians on the radio, that we are leaving, and everyone's all happy and excited. But it was so poorly planned that the Nazis uh, knew about this. They stage a coup on October 15th, 1944, and enter at this point this man here at the bottom, uh, Ferenc Jalasi a virulent anti-Semite and, uh, and the Arrow Cross Party. And uh, so I will let Robert tell you a little bit here about uh, the Arrow Cross Party and what happened next. There was a splinter group, uh, a, 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 a rather a fringe group in Hungary. They were called the Arrow Cross Party. And the people of that party, even in the fascist uh, regime in Hungary, uh, the party was most of the time outlawed. This was a party made up of absolutely the bottom of society, the ones who, are, who were uh, just totally hopeless, uh, uh, full of hate because they had nothing, uh, uh, full of envy because they never amounted up to anything. Uh, th these are people who couldn't even get a, the lowest factory jobs because, first of all, they didn't want to work. Most of them were alcoholics. It's, it's a, it was a terrible, terrible uh, a group of people, plus some young kids who were very impressed with the uh, uniform. They wore black uniforms with an armband, that had a red armband, just like the German armband, and a white, but in, in the white, uh, it was not a swastika, but a, a cross with arrows on each point. So they called themselves the Arrow Cross uh, Party. Now this party was very much uh, on the fringe during the war years, but now the Germans didn't trust any more a legitimate Hungarian government appointed by the region and let them out of prisons, out of the, the pubs, and uh, anybody who wanted uh, basically a weapon could have one. And these people created a terrible situation on the streets of Budapest. There was, there was no more ID card, no more this and that. 
So at this point, the story sort of, uh, we veer into the story of the rescuer, because now that you know a little bit about the Euro Cross Party, uh, enter Jaretsian Ara, or Ara Jaretsian. Now, he will ultimately be the rescuer. I mentioned him uh, earlier. So Jaretsian and his mother were Armenian refugees from the Armenian Genocide, and they came over shortly after, or at the very end of the Armenian Genocide, they came over into Hungary. And um, from an early, uh, early time in life, um, Jaretsian was acutely aware of class differences. He and his mother had very little. She was a seamstress and doing clothes for various people who were wealthy and things. And because of that, he was allowed to go into very well-to-do schools and had these experiences with people far beyond his pay grade. And Jaretsian um, was resentful of this. He didn't understand why there could be such gross uh, disparities in terms of income and therefore, like many youth, I suppose, they you know, are intrigued by ideals of socialist thinking and whatnot. And so this one of the splinter groups was the, this Arrow Cross Party. Um, and Juretsian actually rose, despite the fact that he was you know, not a, a born Hungarian and his name was clearly not Hungarian, it's decidedly Armenian, um, he, uh, he becomes, in, he, he works to a fairly high level, the director of the youth programs of, um, uh, and mobilizing youth forces throughout the entire country of Hungary for the Euro Cross Party. Now, Juretsian claims that he is ignorant of, um, of uh, Zalasi's book, which <laughs> kind of like Mein Kampf for Hitler, was filled with all this vitriol and hatred towards Jews and uh, other people who are not Hungarian born. And, um, but when he discovers this, when he learns of this, he, it's a breaking point for him and he realizes he needs to leave the party in approximately 1939, 1940 or so. So, but he had kept the uniforms and things like that for whatever reason. And suddenly in October 15th, 1944, fast forward, when, um, you know, the Eurocross party is now in charge, he is always an opportunist, this Jaretsi, and he's always looking for business opportunities and things, and he wonders what is next. He fears, you know, what is going to befall Hungary and most likely particularly the Jewish people with whom he had many relations in terms of, uh, you know, through business and whatnot. Uh, in this picture here over to the far right, you see a picture of me with uh, Jaretsi and son. Um, also known as Ara Jaretsian, and Mr. Jaretsian here helped provide me with a lot of anecdotes and additional information, as well as we worked together through the translation of Jaretsian's uh, memoir. So um, he, he leaves the party, he gets the uniform on, and uh, shortly after October 15th, 1944, uh, Jaretsian is driving down uh, along the, the Danube, and he's coming along the Margit Bridge. Uh, and as he's driving along the Margit Bridge, he sees a, an ungodly procession of Arrow Cross people sort of marching out, uh, all these elderly and infirm uh, Jewish people. And there's just, he sees just a horror. Uh, there's beatings, there's gunshots being fired, and these people are completely downtrodden and marching along. And Jaretsian sees this one Arrow Cross man like beating. Uh, this elderly man lying on the ground. Jaretsian pulls over wearing this sort of like bogus old version of a Arrow Cross uniform. And he says, stop, what are you doing? And uh, as detailed in the book, the man says, this man is refusing to move. He is not moving, you know, may, because Jaretsian's rank is evidently higher than this thuggish guy who's beating this elderly Jewish man. And uh, he's, and so the, the thug says to Jaretsian, may I have your permission, sir, to throw him into the Danube. And Jaretsian is thinking in his head, according to him and his memoir, that this is reminding him, it's very close to the bone of you know, what it felt like to be hated and persecuted and murdered um, in, uh, in Armenia and what his family experienced there. And he realizes at this point that if human life, any human life, has gained no more significance than a spent piece of uh, paper, 
uh, and can be thrown into the water and discarded so easily that he's got to do something. And so he thinks in his mind, um, what can I do? And he knows he's uh, fairly close, at least through business, to this man uh, on the left side of the screen here, Dr. Ferenc Volgesi. Volgesi. And uh, Volgesi was sort of famous, very famous in the country as a hypnotist and psychiatrist. And Jaretsian apparently came to know him um, as through a combination of probably two things. One, they were fellow sort of air raid wardens, you know, you know, to protect from bombing. There were various assignments and who's in charge of what building. And Jaretsian had come to know Dr. Volgesi in that way. And there's also some evidence that uh, Jaretsian had also learned a little bit of hypnotism from Dr. Volgesi. But uh, yeah, that's a whole other story. And uh, so he decides to go over to the house where he remembers that Dr. Volgesi lives, which is this large apartment building that happens to be this building here, Wanzi Shijeno Utka, uh, which if you'll recall, that is the very house where Robert and uh, his aunt Aranka and Robert's mother and other family members are now living. Okay, and I'll come back to that slide in a second. So Jaretsian goes over to the house and there he arrives at a terrible scene um, because he's just discovered that the Aero Cross had just been to this place and had taken up to 20 elderly members of the res Jewish residents in this house, including um, this man here, Dr. Emil Zahler's mother, uh, and marched them out and they happened to be coincidentally a part of the procession that was being led out to their deaths across the Margate Bridge, apparently being marched out as far as into Austria for those that made it that far. Um, so Dr. Zahler's there, and of course he sees this, uh, they see this Dretzian in a uniform, and incredulous, what is this, what is this? He says, no, 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 I'm here to help. Where is Dr. Volgesi? You know, I want to talk to him about something to see what we can do. So Dr. Zahler, Dr. Volgesi, and Dretzian, they get together, they're talking, and apparently in the conversation after Jaretsian convinces them of his sincerity and his intent to help, um, they are talking and they realize there are so many physicians, in Jewish physicians in this Zizhigeno house. You know, what do you think about the possibility of making ourselves indispensable so that they won't uh, come and, and rid uh, the, the building of the Jewish people here if we can be of service to them and then they can't get rid of us. And so the plan is sort of hatched um, and it becomes sort of a clinic that they insist will treat all. They know that the Russians are coming closer during the war and um, that this could potentially be an opportunity if they say that they're treating all, including Aerocross people there too, then they're indispensable. So this was their plan. Um, this is the, again, this is the, the, the building here, and uh, this is, these are current pictures of when I went to Budapest a couple of years ago. Um, at the time, and the, on the base floor there, it was a porcelain house, like Haas and Zizek, uh, a porcelain manufacturing house and retail store with a basement below it. And um, I was able to uh, sort of sneak my way into there, and uh, I got in and uh, was able to come into uh, an interior part of the courtyard, not the full courtyard, but there I was able to even like uh, sort of climb over things under cover of darkness and get into a part of the basement just to try to take pictures and to see as much as I could. Um, so yeah, so they're in Zishigeno and they're now setting up and at the time, you know, the, sea, the, the bombings haven't started yet, but they're hoping that this will be a safer alternative than what was happening at the time, and that is the possibilities of ghettos or what was occurring at the Danube. During our stay in this so-called, in that bogus hospital, three times the Arrow Cross was tipped off and came to take us out of the house. There were two possibilities. They were taking Jews into the ghetto they constructed a ghetto in the center of Budapest where they all, from the old Jewish district. Uh, they surrounded it by a wooden wall and according to the rumors it was detonated. It, it was, uh, uh, they laid dynamite and in case of uh, uh, the Soviet victory in Budapest they would have dynamited it in the last moment. Well, luckily uh, that never happened. 
but uh, uh, I did not want to go to the ghetto ever, so I would do anything. Uh, the other alternative was much worse. Uh, many times they were not taking people to the ghetto, they were taking them down to the Danube, where they tied them together, make them took uh, their shoes off, and shut them into the Danube River. So, um, at this point here, uh, I wanted to show you this image here, which shows you a little bit of the, uh, the landscape of the area. Uh, there were two ghettos, as Robert said. One was the larger, the ordinary ghetto, and that is over here. And at the border of this here is the Dohani Street Synagogue. You can see Dohani Street. And um, that kind of formed like the, the outermost part here. And this, there were approximately 70,000 Jewish people that were already sent into there. And it was just a scene of complete deprivation, starvation, disease. And of course, you can see by the evidence of the massacre site here for this ghetto. And then over here, there's the international ghetto. And this, some of you may know of the story of Raoul Wallenberg, another uh, great rescuer. Uh, uh, on behalf of the uh, Swedish government and enabled by the United States even at that time to help uh, to try to get some Jewish people out. And this is a smaller ghetto. These people had sort of quote unquote international protection. The Eurocross didn't care about that at all. And so sure enough there, remember I mentioned the Margaret Bridge, which is where that last scene had occurred where I was talking to you about Dr. Zahler's mother and many others being marched across there towards Austria. Um, uh, this over here, the massacre site, uh, is a, an infamous area that is marked today by an exhibit that's on the cover of the book, The Shoes on the Danube uh, Bank. Um, so this sort of terror was going around, uh, and the Nazis were, of course, frustrated because at this point, their, their routes were closed off. Uh, as of December 1944, this becomes the siege of Budapest. The Soviets have now encircled Budapest. Most of the Nazi heads who were there have already left, and it's nothing now, but many even Aero Cross heads had left, and it's now nothing but the thugs and the biggest scum of the scum running rampant through this area. Um, so two things I want to highlight during this in terms of this period of Aero Cross terror. Um, in the lower right part of the screen here, you see two pictures, and it's kind of a then and now of the Dohani Street Synagogue. Today, if you were to go there, maybe some of you have, it's an incredible ode and monument to Jewish life there and what had occurred in the ghetto. And um, all these bodies you see here that uh, Jewish people who had, were murdered um, in the ghetto, uh, there is now memorial sites here where their remains are buried into sort of these, uh, these beds. Uh, inside there, and there's a real incredible sculpture in there. And so that's the part of the large ghetto. And the other thing then that was occurring, I mentioned to you the, the shootings and the murders on the, the Danube. And uh, the two people shown here are this. So this is a perpetrator. This is this Father Andras Kuhn, who uh, absolutely true stories of uh, things that he had done is a man uh, who apparently had priest credentials wearing this cassock with a, a gun you can see in his holster. And he was infamous for leading Jews out from the international uh, ghetto in particular to the banks of the Danube and uh, ordering them to disrobe and then shoot and, and kill them uh, tied together and bodies falling over. So there were bodies frozen in the middle of winter in the Danube. This man over here in the upper left corner um, I'd love to read you an excerpt of this for, for time purposes. I'm just going to keep moving along, but I'm just going to explain to you that Alfonso, his name is, and he was a very famous uh, art, uh, actor and comedian, and he was accompanied by two assistants, and they were in the international ghetto, and they were marched out by Father Kuhn and these bandits of uh, Arrow Cross, and it was there that uh, one of Alfonso's assistants, Nora, in the book, uh, was indeed murdered and, and said uh, vividly in her last line before she was about to be shot, she looks back at Alfonso and uh, Hannah, the other assistant, and says with a smile, goodbye, sweet life. And uh, she shot into the Danube. Alfonso and Hannah are able to escape because right at that moment, right after the shooting, uh, bombs had fallen over there by the parliament building, which is an incredibly glorious uh, area if you get a chance to ever see it in Budapest. 
and Alfonso and Hannah escape, and they wind up getting rescued by two people from the Wanzi Shijeno building and are brought back and then become a part of the, uh, of the scene in the, in the Yellow Star House. So uh, as I said, boy oh boy, it was like a choice without choices. You, you're in the Zishigeno and Eurocross people are coming uh, periodically to continue to try to get uh, the Jewish people out of there because you should all be in the ghetto or dead. You shouldn't be in these houses anymore. Uh, and Jaretsian saves them. And this is what Robert talks about here before the Russians finally liberate uh, the house in January of 1945. Two times our leader uh, could uh, talk them out of it, uh, could convince them that he knows exactly that these are Jews, but they are working, and uh, it's for the sake of the uh, Hungarian state. The third time, just three days before liberation, uh, a man appeared with 32 uh, arrow cross uh, of his bodyguards uh, with submachine guns. They surrounded the entire uh, the premises and they said this time there is no mercy. We are going to be taken down to the Danube. Our uh, leader just asked one thing. They brought him out too. Uh, they uh, put a revolver to his head and they said, you're going to go with them. He said, before we go, I just would like you to see what you are destroying here and ask if the leader of the group can come and, and take a look at the situation. Uh, they were gone for about an hour and a half and when they came back uh, he lined us up and said that what I had seen here is beyond my imagination. I never thought that Jews are capable of doing this and I want to thank you for your work and I will be the Minister of Jewish Affairs after the war, which is going to be over very soon, because the Germans invented the magic weapon. And then I, each of you will be then uh, given uh, the same kind of uh, papers and identity as Gentiles in Hungary. You will be honorary Gentiles in the new Hungary. Of course, this was, I mean, the most stupid thing we have ever heard in our life. <laughs> but we, uh, uh, we didn't, of course, say anything. We didn't object. The fact was, we survived. After this, three days after this, uh, one morning, uh, the first little 18-year-old Soviet soldier in his fur hat put his head through the uh, emergency exit in our basement where the hospital was. And we knew that as far as we were concerned, the war was over. I took my mother's hand and I asked her to let's go back and see what happened to our apartment. We left our belongings there a great deal, if there's anything left. And at that point, um, Robert and his mother go back to the home that they had lived on, uh, Rotenbiller Utka, and uh, they find another family that is living there and uh, so I won't get into it all, but in a remarkable show sort of, of camaraderie and understanding, they decide to share the space, understanding of each other's circumstances. A little bit later, uh, within a month or so, uh, Robert and his mother are, thank God, uh, their father is alive and he returns holding large salamis before them and some bread and they have a big celebration. Uh, Robert and his family remain very close, but Robert sort of gets, you know, they go around and it was this devastation all around them. So many bodies dead and disease everywhere. And uh, Robert eventually feels this need, you know, I need to get out of this place. And so he makes the eventual decision to leave, uh, to go to Israel, um, winds up returning some years later before the, the revolution in 1956 to Hungary, and he winds up re relocating to the United States, lives in Germany, and ultimately settled in, uh, in Vancouver, Washington, uh, which is uh, where I met him. Uh, the one thing I wanted to say, uh, Boy Jaretsian, um, at this time, 
uh, everyone, as you can imagine, that was hiding and, and living in the, the Zishigeno hospital at this point, they all tried to return to their homes. And now, even though there's still so many people that needed treatment, Juretsian was running out of doctors to be able to treat. And uh, through various sort of interesting circumstances, he winds up getting picked up by uh, the Soviets and taken into various uh, places and, and he's imprisoned and uh, he gets uh, released some nine months later. As, as I said before, Robert didn't know whether Juretsian was alive. He had no idea until much, much later in life after I had met him back in about 2010-11. And uh, so when he found Juretsian, he flies over, he sees him. And uh, Juretsian, of course, doesn't know who he is or doesn't remember who he is, but Robert's talking to him. Juretsian's kind and lets him see some things. And at the end of the conversation, Juretsian passes to Robert his business card, and it just says Juretsian Ara, and then underneath it in Hungarian, manager. And Robert thought that was the perfect description for this sort of amazing guy who just was an opportunist, to a ladies' man who was able to be so successful through these crazy manipulations and made up stories and everything worked and it was magic. And now briefly here, uh, I'd like to introduce you to uh, some, some guests in particular here. And then this next slide, it was my absolute pleasure to get to know uh, a couple of the family members of uh, Dr. Emil Zahler, who I mentioned earlier, who had lost his mother. And uh, for those that have read the book, uh, you see that Robert had truly fallen in love with, uh, with uh, Eva Kadar, this uh, girl with the laughing eyes. She's mentioned several times in the book, and this is uh, the beautiful young lady she was then. And I'm happy here to share, to, in, to introduce you today to uh, Eva's uh, uh, daughter, Carrie Trotner, and uh, just mentioned to you that um, uh, Ava's son, Dr. Danny Berg, lives in the Seattle area and was instrumental to this book's publication and information that he shared with me. So, Carrie? Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate this opportunity to say a few words about my mother, Eva. I'm happy to say that the girl with the laughing eyes is still alive in Toronto and, despite advanced dementia, is still able to enjoy her life at the age of 91. Following the events described in the Yellow Star House, and after some time in a displaced person's camp, she and her mother traveled on a refugee ship to Israel, where she started a new life. After meeting my father in South Africa, they moved to England, where my brother Danny and I were born, and then ultimately to Canada. Our parents had a successful 50 plus year marriage until my father's death in 2013, and Danny and I have five children between us, the great great grandchildren of my mother's hero, Dr. Emil Zoller none of whom would be here if the Arrow Cross or the Nazis had succeeded. Danny eventually moved to Seattle, where he had the great privilege of meeting Paul and then Robert Holzer himself. Danny and Robert spent a day together in Vancouver, Washington, and he was able to connect Robert and Eva by phone. So they were talking for the first time since those dark days 70 years earlier. Mom's story is by default our story, and Danny and I are forever grateful to Paul and Robert for shining light on this incredible part of our mother, grandmother, and great-grandfather's life. And uh, I think Danny just was able to join us briefly, so I'm going to turn things over to him. Oh, hi. Forgive me. I'm, uh, I'm at work today, which requires what you're seeing. Uh, but what a pleasure. I was able to hear most of the broadcast. I've got to know Paul over the last... Uh, few years related to this book and it's just uh, just been an amazing experience for uh, uh, for Robert's story and my mother's story and uh, the story of so many others to to see the light of day and um, yeah it's it's kind of our our past and we're here because of the events that are described in the book so thank you Paul and thanks for in inviting us uh, to, to attend here I'm so glad you could join us Danny thank you so much uh, Carrie as well and so now I'm also going to introduce you to a couple of other amazing people here. And uh, if I can just find out, there it is. Okay. Uh, so here uh, I mentioned to you earlier uh, one of the other people that uh, really, you know, I think this, this whole saving of 400 plus Jews couldn't have happened without Dr. Volgesi as well. And so Dr. Volgesi is pictured in this far left here with his wife Magda. And in this center picture, uh, you see his three children, uh, is uh, Vera, Susie, and Andrew. And then the far right is uh, Dr. Volgesi's uh, wife, uh, Magda, and again with Vera. 
and Robert uh, spoke to me many times as well about, oh my gosh, you should have seen that Dr. Volgesi's uh, daughter, Vera. She was such a beauty. So 15-year-old Robert was in love with all these girls here who were sort of above him in class. Joined, joined him, uh, joining us here today to speak uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Volgesi's uh, family are uh, uh, Martin Ferenzi, the son of uh, Vera, and uh, Kim Hageman, the uh, daughter of Susie. Hello, everybody. I live in Washington, DC. My name is Martin Ferenzi. I'm one of the grandson of Dr. Volghese, and I am the son of Vera. I think that Robert was quite smitten uh, with her. Uh, I'd like to share the following, and it is our incredible thanks to Paul for having written this book. My brother, six cousins, and I learned for the first time about the Yellow Star House in December of 19, less than a year ago. Even our Jewish origins were a secret, which I learned only when I turned 60. The role of Dr. Volges in the book is ambiguous. Was he responsible at the end for Ara's arrest when the Russians liberated Budapest? I don't know but the risk reconstruction of history is very complex. There was a good reason why Robert thought that my mother was beautiful. It was because she was very beautiful. But he saw in her the sunshine that she was until she died in 2017. A quick anecdote, towards the end of the siege of Budapest in February 1945, my mother with two of her friends wanted to meet Russian soldiers. They got out of the cellar where they were hiding. A German shell hit them, killing instantly my mother's friend. By miracle, the shell took away only a portion of my mother's arm. She was sick for a long time. Her father, Dr. Volghese, saved her life. She left Hungary for Paris in 1946 on the last train. Despite all of the above and many other deeply disturbing circumstances, many of which I describe in the book, my mother remained the most positive and joyful person you could ever meet. For her, life was only beautiful and fantastic. She kept the darker chapters of her life a secret, and she always said, do not open all wounds. So thank you very much, Paul, because you have changed our lives, our entire life. Now I'm going to give the Zoom floor to my cousin, Kim. Hi, and in the interest of time, I won't um, go through too much, but I also want to extend my great thanks to Paul for creating this opportunity for all of us. As Martin mentions, um, my mom and her family um, never talked about um, the Yellow Star House or their Jewish heritage. And actually my mom and her younger brother, Andrew, were really only eight and nine years old around the time of the siege of Budapest in 1944. And I don't think she even knew she had Jewish heritage and I'm not sure Andrew did either. Um, but I do know that um, my mom deeply admired her father, Dr. Volghese. She only spoke very highly of him as a father, a person, and a physician. She really did hold him in the highest regard and clearly felt his love and adoration for her. Um, she often shared that her deep love of education and pursuit of her, pursuit of her own happiness was inspired by her Apu father, um, Dr. Volghese. Uh, both Andrew and Susie passed away uh, long ago in 2003 for Andrew and 2008 for my mom, Susie. Um, and that was long before they ever learned um, or perhaps relearning of their Jewish heritage. Um, so I just want to extend our great gratitude and appreciation. My mom's resilience and her joy and love of life and the importance of family remained paramount throughout her life. Um, and, you know, I suspect that there's a web of complexities um, related to how the story ends, um, politically, social situations, as well as individual personalities and circumstances. 
In any case, I wish I had known of the Yellow Star House in the hospital years ago. Um, and I certainly would have liked to have thanked Ara Jaretsian. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin and Kim. And so thank you, truly. Um, it's been my pleasure to get to meet you all. And now last, um, sadly, we don't have very much time here, but boy, I'd love to introduce you to Robert's daughter, uh, uh, Mary uh, De La Fontaine. In this picture here, you see a picture of Robert with his wife in the bottom left corner, uh, Jan, and uh, pictures as well of his father in the center at his favorite coffee house talking to his family. So Mary, if you could please maybe bring us to sort of like a wrap up here with a, a, a little story or so you can share about your dad. Sure. Uh, my father was a great man. Uh, he loved gardening, he loved hiking, he loved animals, and he entered this life, he volunteered with the Humane Society. And I have to thank Paul for the beautiful book. It was a beautiful story. I hope everybody can read it. Thank you. God bless you, Mary. Thank you so much. And please truly give my best uh, to your mom. I, I miss you guys and I hope to see you again soon. So at this point here, I'm uh, going to bring back uh, Alana here. Uh, I, I thank you all. And I guess that's all I've got, Alana. Thank you so, so much, Paul. What a beautiful story. And just this amazing group of people that you've brought together with your research and by, you know, exposing Robert's story and, you know, really bringing together um, just a unique, unique group of people. Uh, it's just outstanding. And I think we see that when we hear their passion and their appreciation for all that you've done. Um, Paul, thank you so much. And it's an honor to work with you. And we're so happy to have you at the Holocaust Center. And for those of you who are listening, if you have not yet read the book, The Yellow Star House, please do so. Um, you can purchase it online from the Queen Anne Book Company or wherever you purchase your books, you will be able to find it. Um, there were a few questions that came in and I'm sorry, we don't have time to get to them, but um, I am gonna share the questions with Paul and he will try to get to any of, any of them that he is able to. So, uh, feel free to email him. You can also find Paul's email on our website if you'd like to contact him directly with more questions about his book and this story. Um, if you're looking for more interesting discussion going on this week, please join us tomorrow for a discussion on the book Hitler's Furies, which details the role of German women in the Holocaust and challenges the notion that women were just simply holding down the home front and supporting their husbands. Even if you haven't read the book, you are welcome to come and join the conversation. It's at 1 p.m. tomorrow, and details are on our website. Book discussions occur twice every month. Um, I want to give a special thank you to Richard Green, our museum and technology director, who's running the technical side of this show. Thank you to all of our participants today um, on our panel uh, for taking the time to join us today, and thank you to everybody who was listening in. Also, a huge thank you to our executive director, Dee Simon, and our entire team at the Holocaust Center, Nicole Bella, Lori Werschel cohen Julia Thompson, Paul, of course, who you heard today, Rosa Campos, Sydney Dreidel, and Ellie Selesky, Amanda Davis, and Katie Lawrence. And I hope you'll be able to join us next Tuesday at the same time for a very special presentation called Let It Not Happen Again, Lessons of the Japanese American Exclusion with speaker Clarence Marwaki. Uh, in March 1942, 227 Japanese Americans were forcibly removed from their homes on Bainbridge Island by the US Army. And starting with this small community, a national strategy began with more than 120,000 Japanese American men, women, and children forcibly removed and incarcerated during World War II. Clarence shares the story of Bainbridge Island as the origin point of the Japanese American exclusion to provide a human historical account of this national tragedy and to ask the question, are there parallels to what's happening in America now? I hope to see you all next week and thank you again to everyone for joining us today. Thank you again, Paul. And this concludes our Lunch and Learn program today. Thank you.